Hi, and welcome back to the George Orr Museum of Art here in Biloxi, Mississippi. I'm Douglas Myatt, a curator here, and uh, today I'd like to take a minute to talk about George Orr. We had some people on campus uh, last week helping us move boxes, and a young man asked me, what's in these boxes? I said, well, they're all biographies of George Orr, and immediately he asked, who is that? So I think maybe we should talk about just who George was and why we even talk about him today. George's parents were from a region in France, or Germany, depending on the time. It was, it was disputed over for years, called Alsace-Lorraine. And his father came over in 1850 to New Orleans, uh, where he met Johanna, was her name, and they married and moved to Biloxi. Uh, George was born in 1857. He uh, trained with his father, who was a, a blacksmith and ornamental iron worker, but he didn't much like working with his dad. So at about the age of 14, he up and moved to New Orleans and took a series of jobs. The story goes that he had 19 jobs before he finally found his way into clay. But that didn't happen for a few years. Uh, George spent a couple of years in New Orleans, came home and worked with his dad a little while longer, further learning the iron trade. And uh, then he got a call from Joseph Meyer in New Orleans, a well-known potter who also happened to have a summer home here in Biloxi out on Deer Island. And Mr. Meyer invited George to come over and learn the pottery trade. Now, to be a potter at that time was much different than the way we think of a potter now. We tend to think of potters more as artists and more as an esoteric occupation. But at the time, it was just as necessary as a blacksmith. Uh, we didn't have Tupperware and we didn't have uh, plastic wrap and aluminum foil. Uh, we had to have things to put our items in, our food items in, things to cook in even. So uh, potters were very much in demand. They, George, once he opened his pottery, made everything from the linings of the flue for a chimney uh, to flower pots, to mugs, to jugs, to this wonderful design of a water jug that was often used on the shallow draft uh, oyster and shrimp boats that we often saw here in the Sound because it had a relatively flat bottom. It was also unglazed, therefore the evaporation was facilitated, keeping the water inside cooler longer. So George made a, uh, a reputation for himself as a local potter. He, after he left uh, Joseph Meyer in New Orleans, he spent a couple of years touring the U.S. and visiting functioning potteries in something like 16 states, if, if memory serves. He probably worked his way uh, around the country by uh, giving time and working at these local potteries. So he not only saw what they were producing, but how they were producing it and how they were getting the effects that they were getting. So when he came back to uh, Biloxi in 1883 with his $26.80 that he had saved up, on land that belonged to his father. He uh, built his own pottery. All of his money went into the brickwork for the kiln. He purchased the wood on shares from a lumberyard, so each person got a little bit of the wood and he got enough to build his first pottery. He opened it in 1883. And what just kind of blows my mind, during all this time, he was making in a functional wear mugs and jugs and chimney flues and flower pots and water bottles and all sorts of things. He was making enough of that to support his family, while at the same time making enough pottery, his art pottery, which we'll come back to in a moment, to show the next year, 1884, in the New Orleans World Exposition. He took over 600 unique pieces to show at the fair there. So that means in that year, he not only had time to create 600 of his fantastical George Orr pieces, but he also created enough of the functional wear, the utilitarian wear, to sell to the locals in order to keep his family fed and the roof over his head. Uh, it's, it's amazing the work ethic he must have had. He had quite a uh, devastating blow, though, at the end of that exposition because the man that he hired to cart all of his pottery back to Biloxi apparently made off with it. So uh, I like to think that somewhere in the bayou and the swamp somewhere outside of New Orleans are 600 pieces of George Orr just waiting to be found because he probably just dumped the cart and made off with the money George paid him. He moved back to Biloxi at this point and uh, he and, and Josephine continued to have children. They would ultimately have 10 children, but only, only five survived to adulthood. Uh, he worked very hard to provide for his family. Uh, by 1888, he was able to build a new pottery, and this is when he finally called himself a Biloxi art potter. He named it the Biloxi Art and Novelty Pottery. It's the first time the word art appears with his name. Um, 
He called himself many different things. He was Pottori George. Uh, and he also called himself the Mad Potter, and people in town called him the Mad Potter. And George realized that this was something he could capitalize on. George was not crazy. Uh, he was crazy like a fox. He was a very good self-promoter. And uh, he knew exactly what he was doing when he boasted about being the best potter in the world. And he had signs around town challenging any potter from anywhere to come and try to best him at throwing pots on the wheel. The whole time during his entire career, George was making functional utilitarian wear. And when he would go to state fairs and world fairs, uh, expositions, and he went to many, he, he, he went to quite a few of these, he would take things that were small and could travel well and that people would buy. Uh, before the days of, of ballpoint pens, everybody had a fountain pen of some sort, and you needed a well on your desk to hold the ink, some sort of bottle for the ink, and George made a, quite a variety of ink wells. Uh, this is one that resembles, or is made to resemble, the house Beauvoir here on Highway 90 in Biloxi, and we have typical uh, Acadian homes, a log cabin over there. The one in the back is a lion head, which uh, actually can hang on the wall as a tile, and it has a hole in the top for the ink and for the pen to go in, uh, to dip into the ink. One of the novelty items that he sold the most of, and probably uh, put as much bread and butter on the table as anything else, were his puzzle mugs. He didn't create the puzzle mug, it was it's an old idea, uh, but he certainly liked it, that idea of uh, a puzzle of some sort, that, that, that little bit of uh, ingenuity and impishness that goes into the idea of puzzle mug would have appealed very much to George. So obviously if you see there are holes so it's like a dribble glass and the way to drink out of it is a combination of covering finger holes and using one around the rim as a straw so that you can drink the liquid in the bottom without even necessarily having to pick the mug up. He also made these little banks, which uh, I think are quite fun and give us a little bit of insight into his character. Uh, he had quite a sense of humor, quite a body sense of humor. Uh, but these guys are just little banks for coins. Um, the brilliant part is that there's no plug in the bottom for a cork or anything uh, to get the money out. So when the child was ready to spend his money, he had to break the bank and come back to George to get another one to start saving all over again. So he was sort of trying to perpetuate a customer base. Another thing that he made quite a few of were what we now call the brothel tokens. And they, they're called the brothel tokens because they tend to have sort of a blue sense of humor. They're a little bit bawdy, a little bit raunchy, I suppose. Um, they're, they're simply ceramic coins, bisque fired, once fired coins uh, that have a saying or a picture on either side. And uh, the sayings are made up of rebuses. It's a, a combination of words and numbers and pictures uh, that make up various sayings. And I guess you should probably come by the museum if you want to take a closer look because some of them do get a little bit uh, R-rated. Um, but we'd love for you to come by and see them. Lots of tourists came to Biloxi. Uh, they came mainly from the Midwest at the time. Uh, snowbirds that would come down and spend, spend the mild winters here. And then by the time the snowbirds were leaving, people from the New Orleans area were coming over to get out of the swampy area in the summer and to have the fresh breezes here on the coast. So there were tourists here most all year round. So George knew he needed to appeal to this trade. So his novelty items, uh, these things were, were sold every day and uh, provided for his family. Uh, he also took them to the fairs, as I mentioned, so that he could spread the word a little bit. I love the idea of him passing out the brothel tokens to the little Victorian ladies on the midway at the World's Fair and uh, seeing their reactions when they read what they were holding. In October of 1894, uh, George suffered a cataclysmic event. There was a big fire that destroyed much of downtown Biloxi. I believe it started in an oyster house, uh, a restaurant down the street from George, but uh, it swept through downtown and it pretty well destroyed the whole area. Um, George's pottery was burned basically to the ground. He lost something like 10,000 pots in the fire. George always felt very close to his pots and he considered them his children, if you will, his clay children. So after the fire, he went through the rubble and he saved every single burned baby, as he called them. And he made shelves when he rebuilt the pottery. All outside around uh, his in enclosed yard outside the pottery uh, were shelves displaying the burned babies. And we have quite a few on display here at the museum as well. He was proud of them because even though they were damaged, each one is unique. Uh, that was his, 
his little catchphrase, everyone is unique, no two alike. He believed that every pot had its own personality and soul and character, and uh, he wanted to maintain it even though that they were, they were damaged after the fire. As devastating as the fire could have been, and as many people could have just given up the, the profession at that point, because it's a difficult profession, uh, George dug his own clay, he brought it to Biloxi, he processed it, he threw the pots, he fired them, he cut the firewood to fire the pots, he did everything. Um, so it's a very difficult profession. But George enjoyed it and he was an artist and he was creating this giant body of work uh, that nobody really knew about because he didn't sell many of his art pots. Remember, his bread and butter were the utilitarian ware and the novelty ware. The, as I call it, art ware uh, was very rarely sold. Sometimes people would come in and find one, spot one on a shelf and say, I'd like to buy that vase right there. And George would say, it's yours for a million dollars. Um, because he particularly thought it was a good piece and didn't want to part with it particularly. So uh, his, his, his art pottery wasn't really getting out there. He developed the idea that his body of work, his art, was not the individual pots, but it was the body of all of his pots. So he began to sell his art pots less and less often. It became more and more rare for him to sell those art pots. Back to the fire, he uh, was able to rebuild over the winter of 1894-1895. He was able to pay for the rebuilding of the pottery essentially by selling subscriptions. He sold one dollar tickets, uh, and the ticket was redeemable for one dollar in pottery items uh, when, when the pottery was rebuilt. So the ticket holder would hold on to it till George could rebuild, then come back and redeem, redeem the ticket for a dollar's worth of pottery. Um, in 1908, I believe, I saw an ad in the Sun Herald uh, that said two flower pots were a nickel at George Orr's studio, so uh, you could do a lot with a dollar at the studio, I think. But it allowed George to rebuild, and he uh, jumped right back into making pottery. And this is the glory days of his career as an art potter. Between 1895 and 1900, George essentially created everything that we think of as George Orr pottery. It started developing all the wild dimples and curves and handles and shapes. Um, it left the realm of being functional wear and leapt directly into being strictly sculptural uh, ceramic wear. He, he didn't intend for it to be used in the end. Um, the work was basically a drawing in 3, 3D. If you look at the negative space around the way he used this as handles, um, he's, he's sculpting, he's drawing for us in 3D. I think of the Picasso video when he's using a lighted pen to draw. Uh, I much think of George's handles and his profiles in that same way. He's doing these fantastical drawings in 3D for us. His glazes became acclaimed and this began to chafe at George. He really felt that the brilliance in his work was in the shapes that he was creating and in the alterations that he was making to the clay. Um, and he, sometime around 1902, uh, decided, forget about it, I'm not going to glaze anything anymore. And he made what I think are some of his very best pots that, that went unglazed. For a long time it was thought that they were unfinished and there were folks who uh, actually put glazes on them and fired them and tried to pass them off as George Potts. Uh, but they ruined a perfectly good bisque pot. Uh, George was saying to us when he quit using glaze that look at my shape, look what I'm doing. I'm doing things that nobody else is doing and it turns out nobody would do those things for another 50-60 years until the abstract expressionists stepped into the, uh, into the art world. By 1907, by 1908, George was having a tough time. Uh, he was having some family trouble, family legal trouble, there were some inheritance issues and actually at one point his uh, family tried to have him declared insane, but he was declared sane by the court, even though he represented himself in court. And uh, reading some of his statements is quite interesting because the man had a, an interesting way with words. But he really began to lay off uh, making pottery at this time. There are a few pieces dated between 1907 and 1909, very few. Um, but like I said earlier, there was an ad in the Sun Herald for flower pots, two for a nickel, 
1908 or 1909, so the local folks were still coming to George to buy the utilitarian objects that they needed, so he was apparently still producing them. We don't think he was producing his artware at this point. And in 1910, he, he basically gave the, the property to his son, Leo, and they opened the Ore Boys Auto Repair. George helped around there. He had all of his training from the iron working, so he was quite a mechanically minded fellow. So he helped his sons until he finally passed away in 1918. George, at one point, had sent a box of pots to the Smithsonian uh, because he wanted, he firmly believed that they belonged there, his pots belonged there, that his canon of work belonged there and deserved the recognition of the art world. Uh, the Smithsonian didn't necessarily agree and they just sort of shoved the box aside and those pieces weren't actually accessioned until 1988, I believe, sometime in the 80s. But how did we find out about George and how did George's name get out there in the first place? When he retired from pottery, his pots were thrown in boxes. Some of them were wrapped, some of them were not wrapped. They were thrown in crates and boxes and put on shelves in, in the auto repair attic area uh, and left there for decades and decades. The story goes that George told his family, don't you ever sell my pots piece by piece. Somebody's going to come along one day and uh, buy them en masse as a big group of, of artworks. Um, I don't know if that story is true or not. I like the sound of it because in the late 60s, about 67 or 68, a gentleman named Jim Carpenter came down from Montague, New Jersey. Jim was an antiques dealer. He often also uh, handled antique automobiles and antique automobile parts. And Jim was looking for, I think it was a, a specific antique Cadillac part. So someone sent him over to the Ore Boys to see what they might have in the warehouse. He couldn't find the uh, actual auto part that he was looking for. Uh, but at some point while he was there, Otto or Leo or one of the boys said, uh, those are daddy's pots in those crates if you want to look around up there. So the story goes that Jim looked in the pots, realized he was seeing a national treasure essentially, and uh, started asking about them. And the, the brothers told him, no, you can't buy the pots, or yes, we'll sell you the pots, but it'll cost you a million dollars. Uh, so Jim went back to New Jersey and it was two or three years of negotiation before he came to uh, an agreement with the family and uh, actually purchased the pots. We do not know exactly what he paid for them. The story is that he paid about $50,000 for the pots. Uh, we think that he got somewhere between five and 8,000 pots. Uh, depends on who's telling the story as to how many he got. But he did take them back to New Jersey, uh, began unpacking them with his, with his wife, covered shelf after shelf and table after table with all of these fantastical George Orr pots, covered in decades of dirt and grime and mud dauber nests. Uh, so he uh, and his wife separated the broken ones from the unbroken ones. They washed them, they cleaned them up, they realized the glazes were spectacular. Uh, and I believe it was in 1974 that they took them into New York City to show them in a gallery for the first time. They happened to catch the eye of uh, Andy Warhol, um, Robert Rauschenberg, and Jasper Johns, three very prominent painters, American modern painters. Uh, they also caught the eye of David Whitney and Philip Johnson, uh, partners in life, and uh, David Whitney was a world-renowned art collector, and Philip Johnson is, uh, was a, a world-famous architect. He uh, designed one of my favorite buildings, the Glass House. But these people began to appreciate George's work and it began finding its way into auction houses. And by 1994, his pieces were commanding uh, quite respectable numbers at auction. So through the intervention of Jim Carpenter, uh, convincing the family to sell him a cache of pottery that he found, uh, we came to find out about George Orr. I hope I've answered some questions you might have had about George Orr. If you have questions about George, please check out our website. It's georgeor.org, and that's G-E-O-R-G-E-O-H-R.org. Very soon you'll have a link there to our uh, video about George. It's about an hour in length, and it comes from Mississippi Public Broadcasting, and you hear from quite a few people, including Garth Clark, who is a luminary in the ceramics world in the United States. Uh, that'll be available very soon. You'll also find all of our email addresses there if you have a question for me. You can email me at curator, C-U-R-A-T-O-R, -R, at georgeor.org, and I'll be happy to answer as many questions as I can.